liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. From the dawn of man, there have been many mysterious sightings and reports from the heavens. Some of these are depicted in caveman drawings from thousands of years ago. This drawing comes from Itolo, Tanzania and dates back over 29,000 years. It appears to document UFOs sending rays to the ground with what seems to be impact marks on the Earth's surface. Proof of alien visitation continues throughout human history. Here we see a picture of Nuremberg on April 14, 1561. Hans Glasser was a journalist of the 16th century. He described a mind-blowing event that occurred in the early hours of the morning. His drawing shows a sky full of strange objects flying back and forth and engaging as if it was an episode of Star Wars, with spacecraft screaming through the skies and fire on the earth. He reports many of the residents witnessed this event and they saw it as a sign of God. And then the Foo Fighters of World War II. Thousands of pilots reported mystery orbs buzzing their aircraft while on bombing runs and patrolling the skies above Europe. This phenomena frightened both the Allied and Axis forces into believing the other had developed a secret weapon in a time where technology had been moving forward with a destructive rate. In fact, Churchill himself was inquiring into the subject, and it's believed he ordered a cover-up through fears of widespread panic. His memo here reads, What does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. Signed, Winston Churchill. 1947, Roswell. Arguably history's most debated UFO event. General William H. Blanchard ordered his press office to release a statement announcing a flying disc recovered from the desert of New Mexico. But two days later rescinded the claim. The cover-up began, military this time stating the wreckage recovered was a high-altitude weather balloon. How military, including a four-star general of the Air Force, could not distinguish the difference between a weather balloon and an alien craft just two days prior is almost as big a mystery as Roswell itself. As we move through modern times, the UFO phenomena has become a movement, with millions of people witnessing strange aerial phenomena. Technology looks to answer the age-old question, who or what is this phenomena? My position now, I think, is that I believe that about 5% of these things are interplanetary, that is, they come to us from a world outside our planetary system, uh, and that some of them uh, are in fact inhabited by intelligent beings of some kind and some uh, look as if they're uh, uh, remotely controlled. The 5% rule has become the status quo for the UFO phenomena. This refers to the amount of sightings reported to those that are thought to be real. This catchphrase can be tracked back throughout modern UFO history. No, 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 no. Oh! I investigated each and every one of them and I found that uh, about 80% could be explained, 15% uh, insufficient data, but 5% extremely interesting. Here are some of the most compelling cases in recent UFO history that fit the 5% club. Rendlesham Forest, over a two-day period starting December 28, 1980. This nuclear-armed airbase located in Britain was subject to an invasion of unidentified flying craft. In this Larry King interview on CNN, Colonel Holt describes what he witnessed. Uh, yes. the, next, the next series of events. While we were in the field investigating, and we were actually looking for maybe burn marks on the ground from what was apparently dripping off this object, we noticed three objects to the north in the sky. They initially were elliptical. They were illuminated with multiple lights and were moving at high speed in sharp angular patterns. We noticed two objects to the south. One of them approached us at very high speed and sent down a beam, I would equate it now to a laser beam, at our feet. Who's the we, Colonel? There were five of us. I took five people out to investigate. What did your command superior say? Uh, at that time, my superiors were silent. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I was com 
communicating with the command post. I did take an audio tape. In fact, I brought the original tape recorder with me. It's a little linear tape recorder that I carried around the base. And I made a tape recording, which is about 15 or 20 minutes long. It's rather famous now. And did you play it for them? Oh, definitely. I played it the well, next day. What did day. they say? Well, my... My boss took it to the 3rd Air Force Commander to the staff meeting the following Wednesday and played it for the staff. The reaction of the staff, from what I'm told, is they didn't know what to do. And the general at that time said, well, it happened off the installation. It's a British matter. Let the British handle it. We found a small blast, what looks like a blasted or scrubbed up area here. We got very positive degrees. It's what we assume is a landing site, all out of the bridge and facing in the same direction towards the center. Never see a pine tree as the damage react that yeah, fast. Bob. The indentations look like something twisted as it got, you know, as it sat down on them. Looks like someone took something and sat it down and twisted it from side to side. Mm -hmm. Very strange. Getting yeah, a definite heat reflection off the tree, about, about three to four feet off the ground. Yes, where the, the same spot is. Exactly same place where the spot is. We're getting a heat spot on the tree directly behind us. I picked up the same thing. One off to your right. Uh, look, three trees in the area, immediately adjacent to the site, within 10 feet of the suspected landing site. We're picking up heat reflection off the trees. This is eerie. This is strange. We are getting an indication of a heat source coming out of that center spot. We're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers burning our animals. They see very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Looks the uh, maybe a quarter to half mile, maybe further out. See if you can get the star scope on it. All right, still there. And all the barnyard animals have gotten quiet now. Weird. It, it, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. It's, it's brighter than it has been. Yeah. It's coming this way. Also, it is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. Okay, we're looking at the thing, we're probably about two to three hundred yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you, it's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's you know, like the pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. Uh, past the farmer's house and across in the next field, now we have multiple sightings of up to five lights with a similar shape and all, but they seem to be steady now rather than a pulsating or glow with a red flash. We just crossed the, the creek, and uh, we're getting what kind of readings? They're getting th three good clicks on the meter, and we're seeing strange lights in the sky. Yeah, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. And the flash is so bright to the star scope that uh, it almost burns your eye. Another compelling case study is Japan Airlines Flight 1628. On November 17th, 1986, Captain Kenju Teriyuchi was flying from Paris to an airport near Tokyo, Japan. They were on the Reykjavik to Anchorage section of the flight. At 5.11 p.m., the crew witnessed two unidentified flying objects to their left. These objects rose from below and closed in on the aircraft. Those two craft then departed and a much larger disc-shaped object started trailing them. It was as if they had been scouted and hunted down. For the next 50 minutes, they were pursued by this unearthly craft through the Alaskan darkness. That forced the pilots to request a change of course from the air traffic control. The pilot stated they had to get away from that object. Captain Teriyuchi said he could feel the heat from the intense glow of the object on his face. Here's a recording of the communication with air traffic control from that day. Almost immediately after this exchange, an urgent message comes in from Elmendorf Air Force Base. Yeah, there's one else too. We have confirmed there is a flight size of two around here, 1550 squad. One primary return only. Okay, where is he following him? It looks like he is, yes. Okay, stand by. Spinner 1628 heavy. Military radar advises they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you. In trail. In trail, I say again. Do you have anybody to scramble up there, or do you want to do that? Oh, we're going to talk to your liaison officer about that. It's 
With military radar confirming the alien craft, and a pilot with over 10,000 hours of flying experience, this makes JAL 1628 one of the best documented cases in UFO history. It's worth noting that Captain Teriyuchi was grounded by Japan Airlines for talking to the press, and was only reinstated as a pilot years later. With all the evidence and compelling information out in the public domain, it would be unimaginable that any denial would be in existence. Yet the very force that the people lock into power continues to subdue vital information on the very subject that could well unlock humanity's destiny. The cover-up dates back years. In 1952, General John Sanford held a press conference after government research into the subject of UFOs. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate a uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. The government deception continues even today. In an official statement from the Obama administration on the subject, they state, the US government has no evidence that any life exists outside our planet, or that an extraterrestrial presence has contacted or engaged any member of the human race. The question has come up in several White House press conferences over the years, and the misinformation, joking, and stigmatizing continues. Or a joke. Maybe it has. Part of a grand conspiracy. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any plans that the president has to uh, uh, make public any information about this. But um, Does that, he feel he's gotten to the bottom of it? Well, I know that he has uh, joked publicly before about uh, one of the benefits of uh, the presidency is having access to that information. Uh, I don't know whether or not he has availed himself of that opportunity. Uh, but um, if we have more on this, we'll let you know. <laughs> At night, under cover of darkness. <laughs> Potentially. But this is no joking matter, and although planet Earth's only superpower refuses to acknowledge the evidence other world governments have, the Mexican government released this footage of unidentified objects tracked by their fighter jets on March 5, 2004, 11 UFOs invading their sovereign airspace. <laughs> And in 2016, the Chilean government declassifies and releases footage taken from one of their Navy helicopters. Twice during the encounter, the UFO ejects an unknown material into the air, which is only visible on the infrared spectrum. To the naked eye, the object itself is barely visible. 
the substance it expels disappears straight into the clouds. Many experts, including aeronautical engineers, were unable to explain this unidentified flying object. Even the British are at it. In recently declassified UFO files from the Ministry of Defense was a story of a fighter pilot, Milton Torres, ordered to shoot down and destroy an unidentified flying object. Here in an interview with Sky News, he talks about his experience. Milton Torres, he's in Miami Forest and uh, over 50 years ago he was ordered to shoot down a UFO when he was based in Britain and he was flying over East Anglia, wasn't far uh, over Norwich City and he was uh, told to shoot down uh, what appeared to be a huge you, you can, object. You could say, hey? You could say, you could say it was somewhere between Norwich and your Ipswich. It was right in that area. It, you, Milton, Are you there? This, you, I know that you locked on and then there was nothing to fire at because this thing went like the speed of sound at, say, 10 mark, uh, 10,000 miles an hour. I have no be. idea. It was 10 mark. 10 Amazing. mark, at least. You must have, I mean, so, for the last 50 years, this thing must have haunted you, didn't it? It certainly did. I wanted to know what it was in the worst possible way. <laughs> this is the sort of thing a scientist wants to dig his teeth into. Did you do some research Are on you it? There. Say again. I was just wondering, had you have you spent a lot of time researching into what it might have been, what it could have been? Well, uh, yes, I did. I did a lot of researching on my own, but I found that nothing that we knew of. So that's the best I could come with. It, it was just way too fast and way too. Uh, well, let's put it this way: he, it uh, it aberrated all of the laws of Newton that. Sir Isaac Newton put in place. So that's why I know it was something different. And it certainly wasn't, you don't feel you could have been fooled by reflections in the sky. There was something solid, something no, tangible there. No, there were there. two of us. There were two of us, myself and my wingman. And my wingman for the life of, life of me, I cannot remember who he was, but uh, whoever he was, uh, I just didn't know who the hell besides myself could be seeing this? So that was two radars up there, and not just one, and the GCI radar as well. When you went up to fly again after that, um, I mean, did you always think I might see it again? Well, I always hoped, but I never saw it again. And what about other pilots? Did you ever talk to other pilots about it? I mean, did other pilots say, yes, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen something? I've talked to several others. I've talked to several of them, and most of them have said they've seen something, but they didn't know what it was. But presumably, and that's about the bottom line. But everybody like you, presumably, was sworn to silence and uh, sort of threatened by the government to keep your mouth oh. shut or lose your job. Well, well, let me tell you why it was so scary to me. They promised to take me out of my airplane, and I, well, I loved my airplane more than I loved anything, including my mother. You know, so as far as I was concerned, that was heresy to talk like that. So when they said that, they got they got my obedience. Sounds like they got your attention, and you got ours as well. Milton Torres, it's been a pleasure talking to you here on Sky News. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from Miami. And yet, even as its allies declassify select information on this phenomenon, the American institutions remain tight-lipped. The one country in the world qualified to know and take us into the age of disclosure continues to evade and deceive this solid evidence that only the meat-minded could deny. And the reason why may be more frightening than a hostile alien invasion itself. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. 
the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society. In 1997, talk show host Art Bell received this disturbing phone call from a man claiming to have worked at Area 51. As this call was unfolding, the entire radio station was knocked off air and only returned on backup systems, with the caller never to be heard of again. Uh, Area 51. Yeah, um, sorry. Were you an employee or are you now? Uh, I, a former employee. Former um, employee. I, I, I was let go on a medical discharge about a week ago, and and <laughs> I, I, I've kind of been running a, across the country. Um, oh man, I don't know where to start. They're uh, they're, they're gonna um, they'll triangulate on this position really really soon. Um, you can't spend a lot of time on the phone, so give us something quick. Okay. Um. Um. Okay, what well, what we're thinking of as as aliens are they're uh, they're they're extra dimensional beings that an earlier precursor of the um, space program made contact with uh, they they are not what they claim to be uh, they have infiltrated a lot of uh, uh, a lot of aspects of of, of military establishment, particularly the Area 51, uh, the, the disasters that are coming, they, the, the military, I'm sorry, the, the government knows about them, and there's a lot of safe areas in this world that they could begin moving the population to now are... But they're not doing, they're not doing anything. They are not, they want the major population centers wiped out so that the, the few that are left will be more easily controllable. If this call was legitimate, it would mean that the human race would be in imminent danger and would explain an alien agenda far darker than one could imagine. That the aliens won't let it happen. <laughs> you reveal all their secrets. <laughs> they, they, they exercise strict control over us. One thing is for certain, UFO sightings are on the rise. In 2017, 
Reports of craft and unusual phenomena are already higher than any year before. There is a build-up of activity and an increasing call for disclosure. with even past presidents now alluding to something locked away deep inside the circle of secrecy. It would seem we are heading towards a penultimate conclusion to this age-old question. I got a letter from 13-year-old Ryan from Belfast. Now, Ryan, if you're out in the crowd tonight, here's the answer to your question. No. As far as I know, an alien spacecraft did not crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. And Ryan, if the United States Air Force did recover alien bodies, they didn't tell me about it either. And I want to know. Tell me about the time you once saw a UFO. Well, I was the district governor of, a, of 56 Lions Clubs in southwest Georgia. And I had to visit all the Lions Clubs and make a speech. And I was outside a, a, a school lunchroom one night, right before sundown. It was getting dark, and we were getting ready to eat supper. And I and about 25 men were standing around, and all of a sudden, in the western sky, we saw a strange light coming towards us, a round light. And it came, got closer and closer, and right above the pine trees, it stopped. And then it began to change colors from blue to red to white. And then it stayed there for a while. We were all aghast. We didn't know what it was. And then it just disappeared into the West. That was the end of it. So it was a genuine UFO in that it was an unidentified flying object. It's time to prepare. The baton is now passed to you. The believers, the knowers, the truthers. Share this movie onto friends and family and to anyone who will listen. And don't forget, join us on our journey of disclosure.